Hello everyone. In the next several videos, I'm going to be going through absolute equity valuation. In this first video, I'm going to talk about estimating the cost of equity or the required rate of return for equity for a firm. I'm going to go through several different methods on estimating the cost of equity. The three general methods I'm going to talk about are the capital asset pricing model. and We talked about this one in class already. And uh, for this one, just some definitions, the excess return or the risk premium for a firm stock is equal to the actual return for the stock minus the risk-free rate. The risk premium for the market is equal to the return for the market minus the risk-free rate. For the market model, we regress the excess return for the firm and the T there indicates that this is a time series regression. We regress that on the excess return for the market. And from that, we generate an alpha or an intercept and a beta. And then we use that beta in the security market line down below, which says that the expected return for the stock is equal to the risk-free rate plus the beta multiplied by the equity risk premium and this equity risk premium we're going to estimate as the historic excess return at the historic annualized excess return for the market although there are other ways to to calculate that that's what we're going to use in this case okay, so let's go to I, I've made up a big spreadsheet here um, I'm not going to give you this completed spreadsheet instead I'm going to show you how to calculate each thing in it. I'm going to and I'm going to give you kind of a blank one. It's going to have some of the things filled in, but I'd like you to follow along with me and I'm going to walk through just every everything I put in here. So, what I've got over here and this is where we're, where we're going to start are the identifiers and these are the identifiers we use to pull in the information from Capital IQ. And let me show you really quickly how we do this. So uh, first off, what I'm using for the market index, sometimes I, in the past I've used the S&P 500. And what I found is that that market index is really heavily weighted on the uh, large firms, certainly because it is the 500, lar 500 largest firms in terms of market cap in the United States. And so I wanted something a little bit more wide ranging and so I'm using the Wilshire 5000 index which is 5000 different stocks so it's it's more of a market um, estimate uh, maybe a little more representative of the market there for the risk free rate I'm using the uh, yield on the 10 year US Treasury it's referred to as the United States Treasury constant maturity 10 years I'm going to show you where to get these identifiers here for those uh, from Capital IQ because they can be a little bit difficult uh, if you don't know what to do and then the firm and we and I've got this all these spreadsheets set up that if you change any of these identifiers then it's going to change everything in the spreadsheets except for one item which we're going to get to later so if I go out here I'm going to go to capital IQ okay so and I want the Wilshire 5000 it's right there So right here is the one I'm using. Um, the The reason why I'm using this one, this is a public fund, it's operating. So this is an actual traded fund. So when I click on it here, if I put this in, it might not work. It's a, t it's a weird ticker symbol. So I'm going up here to the URL and where it says company ID equals, I highlight that 281-24911 and go to copy and then you see it's right here. The only thing you have to do, so I'm just gonna get rid of that. It's gonna throw all this off. I'm gonna, oops, sorry about that. I'm just gonna paste that in there. And it's still not gonna do anything because it says invalid identifier. So what I wanna do here is just put the, the letters IQ in front of it. And there we get it. I did the same thing with the United States Treasury constant maturity uh, 10 years 
uh, I you know looked up that company ID in the URL I highlighted it I put IQ in front of it and that's where we get the risk-free rate here and I'm going to show you how to calculate all these as well so the first thing I want to do I'm going to delete that I'm going to delete that I'm going to delete the returns here all of it I'm going to show you how to put all of these in here so if you go to S&P Capital IQ go to formula builder your cell is going to be this cell right here it's the identifier cell Q4 and then I'm um, looking for market data the equity market data for our stocks we want to use the dividend adjusted day day close price and so what this price does is because we're not putting dividends in our uh, information here we want to make sure the returns from those dividends are included in the in the returns for the stock and so this variable here does that it adjusts the the stock for the dividend the stock price for the dividend and so it um, it, it includes that return so I want to include that so you see down here where it's building our formula in the first item it is our identifier the second is the variable that we want the third is the date so here I'm going to put in I'm going to click cell and highlight the date and then down here I'm going to put add formula and press apply so I'm going to select this cell on B7 I want to freeze the cell here and then A7 I don't want to So I, I'm just going to leave that one alone. For the market price, I'm using again the Wilshire Mutual Funds Wilshire 5000 index. Going to put, go back into my formula builder in this case, and note that I put the put the cursor on the cell before I open up the formula builder. That's important, or you'll just keep putting the this, uh, different formulas in the same cell. So in this case, my identifier is Q2. Again, I'm going to go to equity market data, the last sale price. Well, actually, we'll, we'll do the same thing. Dividend uh, adjustment factor. And as of the date, and again, put in, click that date right there. So again, my identifier, my variable, and then my date. I'm going to add the formula. Press apply. We're good there. Okay. So now what I can do, again, I'm going to go over here where it says Q2 and put in F4 and then I can grab these and I can drag them all the way down so I'm doing 60 months worth my return for Pepsi is equal to the natural log of the most recent price divided by the previous price so that gives me my monthly return they did not have a good month and uh, they're in uh, February market return we do the same thing so I can just drag this over here the risk-free rate for this I'm going to do actually what I just did before for the last two I'm going to go to formula builder my cell identifier is going to be Q3 I'm going to go to so there isn't any um, adjustment factor for these because it is a, a 10 year constant maturity rate so I just put in the last sale price as of including the same date as the other ones um, add formula and apply okay so that looks really big because we have to divide this now by a hundred because what I'll show you what capital IQ actually puts in there so it puts 1.13 and it doesn't and we're going to see this later on in some of the other cells that we work with so it doesn't account for it being a percentage it puts that percentage in as a whole number so we want to divide that by 100 we're going to get really weird answers if we don't and then we can calculate the 
Pepsi Risk Premium, which we're going to use later on. We don't really use in this on this sheet, but we're going to actually use this later on for something we're going to do. And that's going to be equal to the Pepsi return minus the risk-free rate. And actually, I apologize. I need to do one more thing. Um, go back here. Instead of dividing by 12, uh, one, 100, divide by 1,200. The reason why we're doing this is because that rate, that 1.13, is an annual rate as of that date for the 10-year. We don't want the annual date. We want the monthly or the periodic rate. So we're dividing by 12. And then we're going to divide that by 100 to get it into a percentage form. So we're going to divide that by 1,200. Then we're going to do thing, the same thing with the market uh, risk premium. We're going to take the market return minus the risk-free rate. And again, this is a monthly rate, the monthly periodic rate. These are also, they just had really awful months. So uh, oftentimes we would expect to see this large of a return for an annual return or hopefully not see negative ones, but in terms of size, that large. But they just had a bad month that month. So um, that's what we got. So I'm going to pull that down. Oops. Oh, OK, here we go. Apologize for this. I forgot to do something here. I'm going to go up here. I'm going to press F4. There we go. And that'll work now. And then if I, well, I'll just pull it down all the way to show you what happens. I get um, error terms down here because I need at least one extra month of prices in order to get uh, the calculations for the returns. All right. So now we have that portion of this filled out again, and I apologize. The um, the formula here is we we find we take the ten year U S Treasury constant maturity. We want to lock in that cell for the identifier here, and then we divide it by twelve hundred, which is really twelve for to make it a periodic monthly return. And then we divide that also by a thousand, or not a thousand, a hundred, to get it into a percentage form. So here I've got the regression, but I'm going to show you how to do this, all of this here. So I'm going to delete this. So for this part of it, what I want to do is highlight the yellow portion and type in equals line est. My known Ys are the firm's equity risk premium. My known X's are the market risk premium. And then I want to type in comma and true. Um, and, and that first true allows us to have an intercept. If we said false, the intercept would be forced to be zero. Sometimes that's something that you want. Um, in this case, it's not something that we want to do. And then the second comma, the second one gives us the uh, additional regression statistics. And then I'm going to hold down control shift and enter. And so I get my regression outcomes. The beta for this firm is 0.55. The alpha is very small, so that's that intercept that you know we might think of this as the excess return. Um, it, it's very small. It's statistically insignificant. I'm going to show you that now. The t-stat in this case is equal to the coefficient divided by the standard error. The p-value, put in equals t dot dist dot 2t. So this gives us the t-value from a two-tailed distribution. Open parentheses, type in abs for absolute value. And then we're going to highlight that t-stat. And, and so the reason we do this is because we want to know we want to use the absolute value of that t-statistic. So if we have a negative coefficient up here, uh, what would happen if we didn't put that abs in is we would get an error term for our, our probability value. And our degrees of freedom are right here. 
Okay, so in the way this is calculated is the number of observation minus the number of parameters. So our parameters here are the intercept or the alpha and the beta. We have 60 uh, monthly returns that we're using and we subtract from that the two parameters to get the 58 there. I'm going to close parentheses there. And so we get a very, 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 very small p-value, meaning that this is statistically significant pull that over here I get an error because I moved my degrees of freedom highlight the degrees of freedom again there we go it is not statistically significant it's well above that 0.05 threshold all right so the risk-free rate um, I I'm going to show you how to calculate this. So we're going to use the annualized average risk-free rate for the time period. So here I'm going to put in equals 1 plus the average of the risk-free rates for our time period. I'm going to put two parentheses after that. So I have 1 plus that average rate. I'm going to raise that to the 12th power and subtract one, one to annualize that risk-free rate number. The equity risk premium, I'm gonna do the same thing for. I'm gonna take equals one plus the average market risk premium, this uh, column H. And what I'm doing here, if, if you're not familiar with this, um, I, I put my cursor here, I hold down control and shift and press the down button, down arrow, sorry to highlight all of them. I'm going to put in two parentheses there to enclose that, uh, that that portion there. I'm going to go back and spell average correctly. There we go. I'm going to take that to the 12th power, subtract one. That's going to give us our annualized equity risk premium. And so our estimated cost of equity is equal to our risk-free rate plus the beta for the firm multiplied by the equity risk premium. So that is the capital asset pricing model um, in a nutshell for what I want you to do uh, for our, our class and for the stocks that we are looking at, both maybe getting rid of, uh, rid of within our uh, existing portfolio or, or considering keeping in our existing portfolio and the ones that we'll look at to add to the portfolio. All right. So let's go back to the document here. So we, we calculated the um, estimated, or excuse me, the expected return for the capital asset pricing model. The next one we're going to look at is the discounted cash flow model. And so this says the expected return for a stock is equal to the dividend yield plus the growth rate. I'm, I'm going to take you through three different ways to calculate that growth rate. There are other ways. Um, these are, are three kind of wide ranging ways and taking different approaches. The first method is called a retention growth rate and for this we're going to take the return on equity for the firm multiplied by 1 minus the payout ratio. So this DPS divided by EPS is equal to the payout ratio. 1 minus that is referred to as the retention rate. So it's ROE multiplied by, I'll just put this in here, ROE times the retention rate. Okay. The second method is just using analyst estimates for long-term earnings per share growth. And this works well if the firm's dividends track closely with the earnings per share and in the long run for a stable company that is the case that they those dividends should track in the long term with the dividend growth should track in the long term with the earnings per share growth we're actually going to use this earnings per share number again later on and then finally just the historic dividend growth and we're going to use a five-year historic dividend growth uh, and I'm going to show you how to just pull that straight out of capital IQ okay. so Let's go back to our spreadsheet here. I'm going to go to DCF. And so what I've got done here is I've just set this ticker 
to what we have on page one and that just keeps everything consistent and then the company name is just looked up through capital IQ uh, let me show you to do that I'm gonna put in equals or I'm not gonna put in equals I'm just gonna highlight that cell S&P capital IQ formula builder the the identifier cell is B1 and then the thing I'm looking for I'm gonna look under company info and general and get the company name there's no date here because we're assuming it's today and so we're gonna add that formula oops don't want to do that okay I'm gonna can't well I'll just show you what happens I've got it in there twice it's gonna give it to me twice and I don't really want that so I can go out here and just delete that second one uh, the dividend yield so again I'm gonna go out here to capital IQ oops Try that again. There we go. I got a, a little uh, error term down here saying I needed to exit out. When it, when that happens, I usually just move to a, a different cell and then move it back. Uh, if you run into problems with that, let me know. There are some quirky things that happen sometimes. I have instructions from Capital IQ on how to fix those things. And so if you run into problems where it's just giving you error term after error term, I can send you that instructions. There's also a link where you download a little program that, that helps fix um, those things. And so if that happens to you, just just shoot me an email and I can send you, or actually, you know, if it's very time sensitive uh, and I'm not responding, you know, as fast as you need, you can, um, you can contact S&P Capital Support, uh, Capital IQ Support. It's actually there on the website and they will contact you very quickly. You can call them uh, or you can uh, go online with them. And I've had great success with them getting getting back with me very quickly. But but again, I also have that information. I'm happy to send it to you. Um, so the identifier cell is B1 here. And now I'm on dividend yield. I'm just gonna type in data item keyword, dividend yield. There we go. Um, and then I can just click on the dividend yield here. And then the as of date, I'm going to select cell and it's gonna be F1 and we can actually change this. I'll show you to do that too, it's pretty straightforward. So now I'm gonna add the formula and then apply. And you get this really big number again. So um, that's again because capital IQ treats this as a percentage but we don't want that we don't want a yeah whole number like that we want a decimal so I'm going to divide that by a hundred and then I can make it look nice here by doing that and now I can change this so I'm going to change this it's it's currently 331 I'm going to change this to March 20th so I'm getting some weird numbers down here because it's not the end of a year. And I'm going to show you how to put these numbers in too. They might look kind of large and weird. Um, there we go. So, so we've got the dividend yield in there and I've got it as of the last fiscal year or the last year for, for Pepsi. So my retention growth is equal to the ROE multiplied by one minus the payout ratio. So let me show you how to do this. I've got this really big formula out here. And what I want to do, I'm gonna show you how to build, how I built this. So I put in, I, I'm gonna delete that. I'm gonna to go to S&P Capital IQ Formula Builder. There we go. It's giving me this error back down here. There we go. See, I moved it out and moved it back in. Um, the identifier cell is Pepsi uh, B1. I'm looking for the return on equity. So 
I'm going right here, return on equity percentage financial ratios. And then I'm going to have to operate a little bit on, on this next cell. So I'm just going to put in cell and as of 1231, 2019. And then I'm going to show you how to make some changes to this. So it gives me this invalid time period. And that's OK. Um, so what I'm going to do here, remember F1 here, this is my time period. I'm going to put in here concatenate. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to look up the fiscal year end for 2019, because this is a fiscal year end calculation. So this term concatenate. I think I'm saying that right, means to join together uh, two texts. Uh, and so my first text is going to be um, quotes FY. And then my second is going to be year. And then I'm going to highlight the, the date up here. Oops, sorry about that. So what this does is it's going to take the FY, which stands for fiscal year, and then the year portion of the date in F1, or 2019. So it's going to say, look up the return on equity for the fiscal year end of, 12, um, of 2019. And it gives me that great big number again, because capital IQ treats percentages and it puts them in whole numbers. So then I want to divide this by 100. And that gives me my, my correct outcome there. Payout ratio is much the same. We, we use that same concatenate. So I'm going to delete that. I'm going to go to Formula Builder. My cell is, F, uh, is B1. My identifier there is. I'll just put payout ratio. It says IQ payout ratio. And then I'm just going to put cell and as of F1, add formula and apply. So again, it's going to tell me I have an invalid time period. So I'm going to solve this the same way. Again, divide that by 100. So Pepsi pays out 73% approximately of its earnings as dividends, or did that in 2019. And so for this retention growth, we put equals the ROE multiplied by 1 minus the payout ratio, because that's our retention rate and we get an answer of 13.71%. Analyst estimates. So what we're using here is the median analyst estimates for long-term earnings growth. And then notice we also divide this by 100. So I'm going to go to Formula Builder. My identifier cell is again Pepsi. And then I'm going to go to estimates and long term EPS growth rate median. And then I'm just going to press the add formula and then apply. And then again, I need to divide that by 100. There we go. So for the historic dividend growth rate, I'm going to delete that out. I'm going to go to Formula Builder. My identifier cell is still Pepsi. Uh, that's going to be B1. I'm going to go to Financials. And I'm going to go to Growth Ratios. 
And you can see they're, they're in order of the number of years. CAGR, by, by the way, means compound annual growth rate. So I'm going to go to dividends. Let's see, five year. And the dividends tend to be at the end. So dividend per share, five year compound annual growth rate. And my cell is as of 12 31 2019. I'm going to add that formula and press apply. So again, it's got an invalid date. So I'm going to fix that by putting in Sorry, and then I need to divide that by 100. So the historic growth rate as of the end of the last fiscal year was 8.41% per year. All right, and so now I have my three estimates for the discounted cash flow model. The first is 16.51%, and I'll tell you for Pepsi, and this is why we do multiple different um, estimates. For Pepsi, their ROE is really high because they have taken on a lot of debt over the past 10 years and used that to repurchase stock. And so they've changed their capital structure in such a way that it really pushes up that ROE. If you remember back to du the DuPont analysis, the last item in that for um, ROE is that asset multiplier which increases with the amount of debt you have relative to your assets in the, uh, on the balance sheet and so that's that activity by them has really pushed that up high the other two analyst estimates and historic growth are you know not too far apart there okay so our last method that we're going to do Oh, and let me just show you, I, I didn't do this. This is just um, equals to the dividend yield plus the different growth rates that we've done. There we go. And that's how we get those numbers. All right, so the last approach we're gonna take is the bond yield plus risk premium. And this is the only place so far I haven't found a way to upload um, the, a piece of information about the firm. So the one thing that you'll need to look up is the yield on the firm's long-term bonds. And we're gonna use uh, the 10-year the bond for Pepsi in this case. Um, which this is kind of unfortunate to me because I really like being able to just put that ticker symbol in and have everything update. And so far on this, this workbook, everything will update with the exception of this one number. So you have to make sure to look up this one number. In the next video, when I talk about the cost of debt, I'm going to show you a way to estimate this number um, if it's not available. So there is an estimation approach out there that you can use to determine this number. But let's go ahead and look at where we would get this. So uh, I need to log back in. So I'm going to go out here to Pepsi. And then I'm going to go down here to fixed income summary. So for some, for some companies that don't have bonds, there's not going to be anything down here. And for that, you're going to, to do an estimate. But in this case, we can look at the 10-year benchmark security for Pepsi, and it's 2.281%. That's the yield to worst. They have a good bond rating and a plus bond rating from uh, Standard & Poor's. So we're going to go ahead and use that number. If that number weren't available, let me show you where, where else to look. So if that number were not available, you could go to Fixed Income, Security Summary, and it's going to put out all the securities that they've got out. And you can see there are many. Um, and we want to look for the one that has a, this is the maturity date here, about 10 years to maturity. That's the one we're looking at right now. 
that's that 2.281 percent but they have more out there So I'm going to go back here. I'm going to put in 2.281%. And so now I'm going to go through and calculate this, but let me go out first to the document and show you what we're talking about. So the last approach we're going to take is the bond yield plus risk premium. The idea behind this is that, and, and please remember this, the, the required rate of return for a firm's equity must be higher than the required rate of refer um, the required rate of return on a firm's debt, and this is because the bondholders and the lenders to the firm take on less risk than the stockholders. Whenever you buy a firm's bond, you know the cash flows that you're supposed to receive. You know the coupon payment. You know the par value at maturity. Those things are not a surprise. They're not unknown. Um, as long as the fir firm is able to pay those, you know you're going to receive those cash flows. So unlike equity, which you don't know what dividends you're going to receive in the future, you don't know what the price is in the future for that equity. And there is no maturity date, so there's no cash flow to receive at the end of the life of that security. So they, they face less risk in terms of income. Um, the, the bonds actually and additionally face less risk in terms of bankruptcy. Bondholders get paid what they're owed before the stockholders do. Okay. So in both cases, the cash flows of the stock are riskier than the cash flows of the bond. And so bondholders should receive a lower return. Okay. Now, oh, excuse me. Yeah, bondholders should receive a lower return or have a lower expected return than stockholders because if, if stockholders had a lower expected return they wouldn't invest in the stock if they wanted to invest in the company they buy the firm's bonds because they're less risky so we know that the required rate of return equity must be higher than the required rate of return on the firm's bonds okay. so here so we take an uh, the bond rate so the, that yields maturity on the 10-year bond there we go, make that look a little bit better there. And then we add a risk premium to it. Okay, so it's the yield on the firm's long-term bonds plus the firm's equity risk premium. Notice I put in here the firm's equity risk premium. There are several ways we can calculate this. The first is take the beta of the firm multiplied by the market equity risk premium, which is what we did on our first uh, for, the, for the capital asset pricing model. We can take the average return minus the risk-free rate and then we'll annualize that. So, you know, historically, how, you know, what's been the return uh, for the firm minus the return for the risk-free rate? We can use what's called the Fed model. The Fed model is equal to the earnings per share for the next period. So the forward earnings per share divided by the price today minus the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury. And then the last method is to take the dividend yield plus the estimated growth rate in earnings minus the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury. Okay, So um, that the D1 over P0 is the dividend yield. So we're going to estimate all these different ones for the equity risk premium and then we're going to add that equity risk premium to the yield on the firm's long-term bonds. So we've looked up the yield on the long-term bonds we can use what we've already done for this beta multiplied by the ERP by going back to the CAPM model, selecting the beta up here for the firm, multiplied by the equity risk premium for the firm, and that's going to be oh yeah, sorry, not the equity risk premium for the firm. The the equity risk premium for the market, and that's what we've already calculated down here the equity risk premium and we get 6.66 oh yeah that's right the next one is the Fed model this one's a little more complicated so the first thing we want to get is the forward earnings per share or the forward price to earnings ratio so let me show you why let's go back out here 
to the document. So EPS 1 over P sub 0 is the the first number we want to use. The inverse of that is the price to date divided by the forward earnings per share and that would actually give us our forward PE ratio. So P sub 0 divided by the next expected earnings per share is our forward PE ratio. So if we take the inverse of that, we get the first argument in the Fed model, and then we subtract the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury from that, that amount to get the uh, forward PE, uh, excuse me, the, the Fed model calculation. So our forward PE is going to be equal to, I'm going to go out here to uh, the formula builder. My identifier cell is up here. It's J3. And then I'm going to put down here forward. Oops, don't want that. Price to earnings. So my forward PE, and then I'm going to put in my date up here, or actually as of date. No, I want to get rid of that. Sell. There we go. All right, so for my forward PE ratio, I want to select my cell here, go to Formula Builder. My identifier cell is Pepsi. My, I'm going to go out here to Trading Multiples. My forward trading multiples is my forward price to earnings ratio here. And then I want to use the as of date from M2. Add the formula, and press Apply. And I get a forward PE ratio of 20.65497. And then my risk free rate, I'm going to also use the formula builder. My cell identifier here is going to be my 10 year US Treasury. And then I'm going to go out here to market data and uh, equity market data, and then the last sale price as of the date in my cell up here. And then I need to divide this by 100 because our risk free rate was not 92%, it was 0.92% on that date. And so those are my um, estimates for the risk premiums. They are 3.2%, 6.66% and 3.92%. And so here, my beta times my estimated cost of equity is going to be 2.28% plus 3.2%, 2.28% 2 6.66%, and then finally 2.28% plus my Fed model amount, 6.20%. So in the in the workbook here, I've got different dates. If I tried to put in the year end date here for um, 2019, I'm going to get an error message. So you have to kind of play around with this a little bit. I'm going to get the error message for the Fed model because there wasn't a forward PE on that date um, because it probably wasn't a trading day.
So and on this sheet, I have to use the 2019 date because we don't have a fiscal year end date for the ROE. Notice the analyst estimates don't change because they're using the current analyst estimates. And then finally back here, um, we don't have a date. We're using the last five years worth of returns. You can always change this up a little bit. So if we get into a new month and you want to include that, you can actually start with this date and then you know go a few months before that and then drag it down the rest of the way. And that'll change all of your information here. So let me just show you um, a, a more difficult one. So we it, it, for Pepsi, we get an estimated cost of equity from the cap M of 5.47%. And, and that's, remember, the beta here is low. And so that's going to give us a low outcome for this number. Our discounted cash flow estimates are 16.51, 9.88, And then finally, you know, our bond yield plus the risk premium, 5.48. Again, you're getting, you're using the same information here that you're using from the CAPM model. So the CAPM model was 5.47, the bond yield plus risk premium 5.48, um, historic firm um, risk premium 8.94, and then finally the Fed model 6.20. So we get a wide range of numbers and really your job at that point is to kind of think through how each of these is calculated and and you know from that range of numbers decide on an um, a reasonable estimate of the cost of equity so for example this 16.51 we know this ROE is high because I told you but we know if we look to the financial statements that that ROE is high because Pepsi has been changing their capital structure so the question is is that change sustainable can they keep doing that and the answer is no they can't continue to keep and they've they've actually slowed down on this but uh, for a while they were issuing a lot of debt and using the proceeds to repurchase their stock at some point they're gonna run out of stock to repurchase and so or they're gonna get to that place where they want to be with their capital structure so it doesn't make sense for for us to use that number because that number is not sustainable so this number here, this retention growth rate, is not sustainable. That's not a sustainable retention growth rate. Our analyst estimates and our historic growth are, are kind of close together there, there. So they're not terribly far apart. So we get these two estimates, 10 to 11% for that. Uh, we get 9% here for this estimate. And so maybe that's the range you want to think of, 9 to 11%. When we get down to the actual valuation, I'm going to show you how to conduct a sensitivity analysis where we can actually come up with several different estimates for the value of the firm based on uh, these different numbers that we're looking at. Okay, um, so let me put in one here that's maybe a little more troublesome than Pepsi, and that's Tesla. Okay, Tesla's going to look weird. Um, Tesla surprisingly has a low beta, even though we kind of probably consider them to be consumer discretionary. Um, people don't have to buy Teslas. They're kind of seen as a luxury vehicle. And yet they have a very low coefficient, probably because the folks buying Teslas aren't really, I don't know, too dependent upon the economy. They, the economy's done really well in the last five years. Teslas got, had a rough time from here to here and there uh, due to things that their CEO may be doing. Um, the R square for this is extremely low, even for a, a an individual firm the p-value for this beta is not statistically significant so there's a lot of things pointing here that we might indicate that we don't want to use this number that that's an awfully low number you can see this page has um, updated and things look weird here and for good reason Tesla doesn't pay a dividend so this is the discounted cash flow model which really works better for firms that pay dividends and a regular dividend their retention growth rate is negative because they have a negative ROE for 2019. 
Um, analyst estimates for growth are extraordinarily high. So we get these really weird numbers and there is no historic growth in the dividends because there is no dividends. Okay. And then finally, the bond yield plus risk premium. So I can tell you what the risk premium is for, or excuse me, the bond yield is for Tesla. I believe it's zero. Let's just check. Oh, they do have some bonds outstanding. I did not, I didn't know that. Well, actually, you can see your retail notes. So these are actually um, loans. Um, some of these are loans. Let's go out here and see what we can do. So we've got some here, um, April 2nd. And this is, oh, so notice this is Tesla Energy Operations not Tesla Inc. Let's see what we can find here. So our, our kind of our closest here, yield to worst, they don't have a great credit rating, 6.785. Okay, so that's what we're gonna use here. Still kind of all over the ballpark. The cost of equity using the beta number is at 11%. The historic firm risk premium is 30.59%. And the Fed model is 6.86%. So this is, Tesla would be a difficult one to use these different estimates for. Uh, it's something we may want to, you know, dig in more if that's a company you want to look at. Um, I'll put Coca-Cola in here. Actually, let's put in McDonald's. So McDonald's, we would expect to have a low required rate of return on equity. Um, it does have a low amount uh, here. The discounted cash flow approach. So we get um, an ROE value that is not identified here. Let's see if we change the dates here. Yeah, we don't get anything there. I'm going to assume that their fiscal year in 2019 hasn't occurred yet. Um, and that, that can certainly be the case if they have, yeah, that's weird. It's something we probably need to look up if we were uh, trying to look up the, um, the value here. Let's look up Apple. So we can see here their R square is decent for, the, for, for an individual company. They have a high beta, which isn't surprising. Their cost of equity is 10.4% according to this. For the discounted cash flow model, let's put in the last year end. Um, we get a retention growth rate of 42.68%. That's probably a little bit high. Um, these other two are fairly close. Analyst estimates at 13.94%, historic growth at 11.56. The cap M was 10.4. So those three estimates are actually kind of close together. They're all fairly reasonable estimates. And the bond yield plus risk premium, again, this historic firm risk premium is, is high. Uh, that's because um, Apple has done very well recently. We need to go out here and look up their bonds. They do have some debt outstanding. So I'm going to go to the summary fixed income. Our yield to worst with our 10 year benchmark security is 1.878. And so that's going to give us a um, beta times uh, the equity risk premium of 10.01%, the historic firm risk premium of 17.41, and then the, using the Fed model, we get 6.12%. So we're getting several of these estimates that are consistent. 10% here, discounted cash flow model, 14% 12%, cap M model is 10% or 10.4%. So we're getting several different estimates. So if, if I just had 
this beta times the ERP estimate at 10.01 and the CAPM at 10.40. Those are going to be strongly related because they're using the same information or similar information to get to the same place. But looking at this discounted cash flow model, these are a little bit higher, 11.5% and 14% approximately. This is 10.1, 10.01, this is 10.40. And so I would say, you know, when we do a sensitivity analysis, we want to include that range in there uh, to see where our prices come out. All right. So um, this is it for this spreadsheet, this workbook. We're going to add to onto this workbook in, in future videos. Please let me know if you have any questions.